Welcome. Thank you so much for coming tonight. As we begin preparing our hearts for this incredible time of year that we choose to celebrate our risen Savior, um, there's a, no better thing to start with than really a deep understanding of what is Passover, what is grace, what, why do we do communion, all these things. What a wonderful place to start as we truly understand that Jesus is our way to God. Jesus is our way of truth and understanding of what the resurrection means for us. So I am so excited because we have Aaron and Judy with us tonight, all the way from Louisville. <laughs> and they are here to share with us an understanding of the Savior. So just open your hearts and your minds to receive what God has for you to receive tonight. And I'd like to say a prayer and then turn things over to you, God. God, thank you for the opportunity of salvation, an opportunity to connect with you in real and tangible ways as we acknowledge who we are, our sin. We recognize our not only desire but our, our necessity for you. What you have done for us 2,000 years ago, we can never repay. But God, may we deeply understand what it is and what it means as we strive to glorify your holy name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, you can hear me. My name is Aaron Bortz. I don't, some of you I might have met before in a, a study that we, we took took place at the, at, um, the Sparks's. But... Um, First of all, I want to start off by telling you that anything that Terry has told you about me, don't believe in me. That's fine. Now that we got that out of the way. Okay, this is the Passover Seder, and uh, we are going to be talking about that tonight to give you a, a much greater insight into your faith and into what Christianity, you know, the basis and the root for the Christianity is, uh, is erected upon. So I'm sure that I want to start off with one thing. I'm sure some of you might have read through Corinthians, and I go to chapter 5, <clears throat> and your boasting is no good. Don't you know that a little hummus leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old leaven or hummus, so you may be a new batch, just as you are unleavened. For Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with... Uh, old hummus, the hummus of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread, the matzah of sincerity and truth. Now, you know, reading through that, I know a lot of friends of mine that weren't raised Jewish, like I was, would not, what's he talking about? I guess I'll just skip this part and move on to something else. I'll go to the book of Revelation or something. But uh, this is very important. Paul was talking to these Corinthians, and he wanted to tell them about, um, about the importance of their faith. And, and the basis of that faith, and Messiah, our Passover, he says, Messiah, our Passover, who was sacrificed for us. And, and of course, he said that. They had Jewish people there in Corinth, so they would explain it to the other people that were in the congregation. Usually, the, the Jewish people were the minority of the congregation, but uh, still, they had people to explain it. Just like when he wrote to the Romans, he said certain things that were very Jewish, and they had to have somebody there to explain it. I mean, after all, you know, why would you why would you know any of this stuff unless you have to? And uh, it's important to be uh, exposed to that. So we're, you heard me talk about the leaven, and that's exactly where I'm going to start. As you as the people move to towards the seder itself and the Passover, during that week they're not eating any leaven. They are only to eat unleavened everything and uh, to be kosher and to be in the spirit um, of what was to be done. Uh, if you look in the, in the Tanakh, when the Old Testament, it talks about the fact that the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed, then they have that Passover lamb on the first night. And then what's following that week is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where they're only partaking of unleavened bread. So in, in, uh, in an Orthodox home, a very, a very uh, observant home, because I grew up in a, in a not so observant home. My grandmother was, was somewhat uh, strict, 
but her children were not. I mean, I, I'd go to her Seder and they put the children off to a table and then the adults all had their own big long table and, and supposedly they were going to go through all the liturgy that you and I are going to review tonight. Uh, but my dad was in a big hurry to eat because he liked my grandmother's cooking a lot. Okay, so, and she was really a good cook. So we didn't have a whole lot of observance. It's just the way it was. But on the other hand, if you're in an Orthodox home where the people are more involved in the, in the liturgical approach and the observances, they have to get all the leaven out of the house. They search through the whole house. They send the kids running through. Matter of fact, sometimes the, the father might take a piece of bread and hide it behind a book in the library. And they'll find that and they'll bring that to him. And, and they might give him a reward for finding that. In, in Israel, where you have an Orthodox community and they are living by themselves and they have their own village, and I have pictures of it at home, they would take all the leaven and they take it out into the center of the town and the village and they burn it right there. And it was a celebration. After all, a holiday is approaching and it's a time to celebrate the Feast of the Passover. It's a time to celebrate the freedom from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And they were to do this every year. God really identifies himself, not just as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but if you look in your Bible, when God appears, he says, I am the God who took you out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt. He always identifies himself with that. In other words, God is a deliverer. God is the one that's going to rescue us from our bondage. Now, it could be the bondage of slavery in Egypt, but, or, but in the today's uh, realm, we think of him rescuing us from the bondage to sin, which is a much greater slavery and can eliminate us from God's uh, future kingdom. So here we are, we're, uh, we've got the leaven out, and you, you know, I, I wanna say maybe a couple of the blessings. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech alam asher kiddushana b'mitzvotav v'sivanu al be'or ha'metz. Now you have these books, by the way, I'm sorry. I get real bad about that. I'm on page one. Now, one thing I want you to know, and it looks like Randy did a really good job, it goes from right to left. I had somebody, I did a Seder demonstration at a, at a uh, Christian church in Louisville to a bunch of seniors, and the lady said, well, it's wrong, it's going from the right to I said, ma'am, we're doing it the right way tonight. <laughs> we do it the right way. This is the way uh, Hebrew is written. Hebrew is written from right to left. So this, the books are also the same way. So we see here the searching of the leaven, and we got all the leaven out, and we're ready to celebrate the Passover feast, and now we have the kindling of the candles. By my wife of 50 years. Yay. She hasn't looked that old, does she? Seder and brings light to the table, let us remember that the Lord used a woman to bring forth our Messiah, the light of the world. Now this book is called a Haggadah, and uh, this is a Messianic Haggadah. It uh, was put together by Jewish believers, and that's the one we're using tonight, because the other ones don't have all this important things in there about the Messiah. Okay, now the very first thing we do, and as we move through the Seder, you'll notice there are different cups. And we have this very first cup, and you all should take this time right now to put some grape juice in your cups. Well, I, I guess I can talk. The first cup, Kiddush, means sanctification, because God said, I will bring you out from under the bondage of the Egyptians. And sanctification, and to be sanctified, is to be separated. You know, as believers in the Messiah, we are separated from this world, in a sense. 
because he separates us from the bondage of sin. Okay, that's what you call being born again. You've been sanctified. You've been set apart by the living God. But the, this cup here celebrates the... Uh, don't worry about spilling it. As a matter of fact, we, it was our first sitter, I think, that we had this year where we didn't have some kids spill grape juice everywhere. I mean, it just goes everywhere. Okay, so we all, we all there? Okay, good. Now, you don't have to drink the whole thing. We just take sips here because... We don't want to keep refilling this thing. And we can all take it up together. Don't drink it yet. Don't drink it yet. I'm sorry. Because we have to have a blessing. And this is probably the same blessing that the Lord said in his day. Baruch atadonoi, Eloheinu melech halavam, bore pri hagafen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who makes a distinction between the holy and the plain, between the light and the darkness between Israel and the other nations, between the seventh and the sixth days of work. You have distinguished and made holy your people with your holiness. Blessed art thou who makes the distinction between the holy and the plain. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam shehichiyana v'hichimana v'hichiyana v'zman hazeh. Blessed art thou, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life and has preserved us and has enabled us to reach this season. We now partake. Thank you for your patience. Okay, now the next thing that takes place is called Urchatz. Now, uh, in a Jewish home, the evening of the Seder meal, the, the father is the priest of the household for that evening. Whether he's a born of the Levitical priesthood or not, you know, that doesn't make any difference. He's the priest of the household. He's the intercessor for the rest of the family as he is instructing them in what is to take place and the importance of what's to take place. He'll be dressed in something. Now, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a kettle. It's called a kittle. And it's a big, long, white robe, and it goes all the way down the floor. And it's, it's sort of a priestly garment. And he'll have a, a kippah on that'll be white, etc. So, and then what's he going to do next? Well, the next thing he's going to do is he's going to wash his hands. Now, all he has is a bottle of water, or a bottle of water, a bowl of water on the table. And you and I both know that, that just dipping your hands in water doesn't make them clean. you got to use soap, right? I, I tried to talk my mother into that because I didn't need soap, but it didn't ever work. And uh, so they're really ceremonially cleansing themselves, okay? It's a matter of showing that you have an intention of getting close to God by, by washing off uh, the, the old self. Uh, it it's, sounds a whole lot like baptism, doesn't it? Now, whether you know it or not, you know, as a kid, I, they used to call Jewish people that became Christians mashumit, and that meant baptized once. Oh, they were baptized. The only problem is Jewish people don't realize it's a Jewish tradition. When they came out to see John the Baptist, or Yochanan Hamapil, John the Immerser, and, and they, uh, they, they wanted to repent, repent. what did he tell them? He said, well, they were, be they were being baptized. Because baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. Now, I'm sure you've all heard that before. But, uh, you know, you don't really just get clean by dipping in the water, but it's showing that you have every intent of repenting and wanting to turn away from your life. So you want to dip yourselves in that water and you come out as just like they did in Acts 2.38. You know, 5,000 people at one time were baptized. They didn't have somebody there dipping them all individually. That would have taken a long time, first of all. Second of all, it was probably more than 5,000 because they didn't count the women and the children. But in Jerusalem, they had these huge pools, and they would go down, and they would dip themselves in the pools, and they would baptize themselves. If you were to go to Israel today, and you go to the uh, Wailing Wall, or the, where they, the, they will come and pray, they'll, you'll see basins of water there. Have you been? You've been there. Since. They have basins of water there to dip your hands in. And it's really just a ceremonial cleansing. It's, it's uh, an outward sign of an inward desire to change, okay? So that's what we're doing here. This is Urchatz, and that's, that's the background that you have for, for your water baptism. Okay, now the next thing, and somebody asked me when we're going to eat. Well, this is the only thing you're going to get to eat for a little while. And, and, uh, but don't complain too much, because I knew guys that were in Orthodox homes who they were sitting there for two hours going through all this stuff. You know, I'm only going to take about 45 minutes, hopefully. Uh, but two hours before they got to eat, so don't complain. But, okay, so the carpus. 
The wine, which is red in color, represents the blood of the Passover lamb. The parsley represents the hyssop used to put the blood of the lamb upon the top and sides of the doorframe. The salt water represents the Red Sea as well as the tears shed in Egypt. So you have salt water there. You have this carpus. Now that is is uh, symbolic of the uh, of the fruits of the, the earth, which God grants us. You know, you can plant all you want, but it's God that makes brings forth the increase, right? So, uh, so we uh, we want to take this right now in recognition, and it's the first thing we get to eat. So you take this, you dip it in the salt water. Uh, and then you eat it. And I hope you'll like it because you're not going to be eating anything else for a lot of, oh, that's good salty water, too. Oh, that's really good salty water. Makes you feel, you feel the bitterness of the tears, you know, that they shed, shed in Egypt. Baruch atananai, Eloheinu melech haolam, bori pri ha'adama. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the earth. Okay, now we're going to turn to page five. Page five. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do is the yachas. And I need my hand, so I'm going to put this in here. And if you can't hear me, kind of just raise your hand, and I'll try to do a better job. How's that? Can you hear me now? Good. You sound like a TV, I mean a cell phone commercial. Okay, now we have three matzahs here. And um, there's a, a number of explanations for the three matzahs. One is uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the three uh, fathers of the faith. Then you have the three divisions of Israel, which would be the Cohens, which are the high priests, the descendants of Aaron. Then you have the Levites. They're the ones that did everything. They were descendants from Levi. They were also related to Aaron, but they were... They were Levium, it's called, and they did all the work in the temple. I mean, they did the cleaning. There were Levites that did the lighting of the candles. They did all this stuff. The Cohens were just involved in the sacrifices, like like um, John's uh, Yochanan, John the Baptist's father was a priest, Zechariah. And then we have uh, what I prefer, and that is Ha'av, the father, Ha'ben, the son, and Ha. Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit. We have three matzahs. So what is done now is we take this bag and we take the middle matzah out. Remember I said Ha'af, Ha'ben, the Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh. And we take the middle matzah and we break it in half. And we take part of it, one half, and we put it here. In, uh, back in the bag with the other two and then we take this one here and we wrap this up uh, we have a little bag here, a little more decorative bag, but we wrap this up and put it here and it's called the afikomen now what that means nobody really knows, it's Greek I don't know, it, it, it could mean uh, we think that's where the derivation is it could mean I've come some uh, Alfred Edersheim who wrote the life and times of Jesus the Messiah Jewish believer in the Messiah he said it's just called the after dinner the after dinner uh, treat. So what we do in at home is we take this and we hide it. And then the children go looking for it. And then the, ch the child that finds it is rewarded. Of course, it doesn't always work that way when you have one that's 11, a grandson that's 11, and a granddaughter is 7, and the 7-year-old finds it. You know the 11-year-old is going to pitch a fit, and that's usually what happens. But we, we always work things out. Everybody was happy. Right, <laughs> Judy? Right. Okay, everybody's happy. And, uh, but we'll be hiding that a little later, okay? Although I don't really see any really young people here. Okay. Well, we have a few young people. Okay. This is the story, the monkey. The Lord said, now I'm on page five still, if you want to read with me, please. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month of the year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. The animals you choose must be a year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. They, they actually do, they remember, well, we're going to get in a minute. I'm sorry. They are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. 
The same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with the bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire. Do not leave any of it until morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So well, the first thing we need to remember is, is they took this hyssop, which is a, for a sop, and they went to the doors of their houses, and they did the lentils and the door frames. Now, some people tried to extrapolate that into the fact that as the blood ran, it, it made a cross. I don't know if that's what happened. The important thing is the blood. That's what we really need to focus on. Because as the angel of, the de of death passed over Egypt that night, anything that did not have the blood on the door, the firstborn in that household was taken. Pets, uh, stock, livestock, children, everything. The firstborn were taken. Now, when it passed over, it didn't look in to see any pedigree. It didn't look in the, in the house to see if they were Jewish people, if it was Moses and his kids and family. It didn't look inside to see if these people had real big IRAs or 401ks. All it did, all it did was look for the blood. That's it. And if there was blood on the door of an Egyptian, guess what? The firstborn in that house was not taken either. So it's a, it's a really important thing. You know, God really wants to get our attention with blood. Now, actually, on the day of the, if you'll, you'll, you'll look, read in your Bibles when Yeshua met, Yeshua, by the way, I apologize. I'll say Yeshua, that's Jesus' name in Hebrew. Okay, that's what his mama called him. That's what I tend to say a lot, okay? I'll say Yeshua. There's nothing wrong with the name of Jesus or Isu, I've heard that in Russia, or Jesus, that's the, the Spanish say that. I say Yeshua, okay? So if you're looking at me kind of weird and you don't know who I'm talking about, it's Yeshua, okay? Uh, but when he met with them, that was on the day of the preparation. And he, of course, he told them to go prepare for the Passover Seder. He really wanted to have this Passover Seder with them. And uh, what was taking place on that day was the sacrifice. They literally would have an assembly line of priests and a bucket brigade, I mean, with the blood. And the streets would run with the blood, they said. And these, these priests would wear the, the white garments and they'd just be stained with the blood because of all these lambs that they were killing because Israel was just packed full of people. It, you know, back then, if you lived in the land, you went there for the Passover Seder. If you lived in Rome or in Tarsus, where Paul grew up or lived, they sent delegations from their synagogues so the whole place was just packed with people. And uh, just like when Yeshua was crucified, it was really full of, of people. But the blood is everywhere. And once again, you have to think, I don't know about you, I take blood seriously, especially when it's my blood, but you take it seriously because it means there's something going on when you see a lot of that blood. And, and blood is the life of the flesh. God says, don't eat the, the blood because the, the life of the flesh is in the blood. If you look back in, in the dietary laws that are in the Old Testament, that's one of the things he tells you, don't eat the blood. Well, blood is used for the forgiveness of sin. He took the sin, he put it on the altar. And then also there was the blood that Messiah sacrificed us, us with, okay? So there you go. It's, uh, there's an awful lot going on. And there's an awful lot to think about. And these people are right in the middle of all of this. As God saw the blood and passed over the houses of the Israelites, so does he pass over our sins when he sees Yeshua's blood shed on our behalf. We keep Passover to remember the physical deliverance God gave us in Egypt, and we keep Messiah's Passover to remind us of the spiritual deliverance he brings us from sin. And we already looked at the matzah. These are the matzah. Uh, that are, this is the bread of affliction which our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. You all have that in front of you. Let all who are hungry come and eat. All who are needy, let them come and celebrate the Passover with us. Now we are here. Next year, may we eat in the land of Israel. Now we are slaves. Next year, may we be free men. We put the plate down and the moss is covered. Okay. Now, next, we move into something very important called the four questions. Now, I, I will just give you a taste of it, and then we'll move on, because we, who would be the young, oh, we got a young man in here. Are you the youngest in your family, young man? Uh, 
That's all right. <laughs> You're younger than I am. I need you. To, I need you to come up here for a minute. Okay. okay. You don't mind? No. I'm going to be. I'm going to be soliciting some readers here, so that you'll come and get behind this microphone here, and um, and you can have this. Okay, and then in a minute I'm going to tell you to read these four questions. Don't worry, I won't ask you to read them in Hebrew unless you want to. Because then, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the little thing is, you, up here you go, Manish Tanahawai Lahazev, Michal Halelahot. Now, if you remember, uh, anybody here see The Passion? Mm -hmm. The movie The Passion? Mm -hmm. At the beginning, when Mary and Miriam are in the house, and they think, that, oh, this night's real, what's going on? You know, they felt different, and it was the night that he was taken. And one woman looks at the other. The movie was, all you heard was Aramaic, but I was excited because I could understand what she said. She said, Why is this night different from all other nights? So you can go ahead and read here. These are the four questions. Usually the youngest boy in the house will read these. So you can just go ahead and read them in English, please. Okay. On all other nights. Oh, it's right here. Why is, why is this night different from all other nights? Number one, on all other nights, we eat either leavened bread or matzo. On this night, why do we eat only matzo? Number two, on all other nights, we eat vegetables and herbs of any kind. On this night, why do we eat only bitter herbs? Number three, on all other nights, we never dip our herbs, herbs even once. On this night, why do we dip them twice? On all other nights, we eat sitting up or reclining on this night, why do we eat in a reclining position? Thank you very much. Okay. And thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. I hope you don't mind me getting you to do that. No? Uh, now, so there's a number of things. They're asking questions. The kids, you see, they're training the children on the deliverance of Israel from the Egyptians. Uh, every Jew that is alive is to think of themselves as going out of the land of Egypt under God's direction. Even though we're here in the 20, 21st century, we're to think of ourselves as being with them because we remember God's deliverance. Okay? It's a very important thing. We, otherwise, we'd still be in Egypt, free labor. <laughs> and, and the reclining position, they, I read something very interesting last night that one scholar is, 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 is telling you how he thought the disciples were arranged uh, in the seating. And I found that interesting. Um, but they're reclining. You know, they, they didn't have chairs and tables like we did. They might have a low table, and then they had all these pillows around them. Because you see, reclining while you eat is a sign of a free man, and they were free. And uh, you had you had the Yeshua here, and then on one side you had Yochanan John, and on the other side was Judas. And way over on the other side of the table was Peter. It's not like what we see when we draw a picture of the Last Supper. You know, they have them all sitting around the table and they're all on one side. No, I'm sorry. You know, that's not the way they ate. And, uh, but they're all sitting around the table and they're all reclining and they're all wanting to enjoy this, this service, this holiday. It was an important thing. The food's supposed to be good. They get to eat a lot. And they also had this fellowship with each other. So now if you'll turn with me to page 9. So, uh, you know there's some rabbis in here, their names, and some people have trouble with it. Uh, okay, I'll just read that, and then Susan's going to come up and read the next page for me. Is that okay? Uh, sure. Okay, thank you, Susan. <laughs> I, I know I can trust Susan. We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord our God brought us out from there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. If God had not brought our forefathers out from Egypt, then even we and our children and our children's children might still have been enslaved to Pharaoh in Egypt. Therefore, even if we were all wise, all people of understanding, even if we were all old and well learned in the Torah, it will still be our duty to tell the story of the departure from Egypt. And the more one tells of the departure from Egypt, the more he is to be praised. It is told that Rabbi Eleazar, Rabbi Joshua, Rabbi Eleazar ben Azariah, Rabbi Akiva, and Rabbi Tarfon sat all night telling the story of the Exodus. Rabbi Eleazar said, Here I am, a man of 70 years, yet I do not understand why the story of the departure from Egypt is told at night. 
until Ben Zoma explained it. The scripture, the scripture commands us saying that you may remember the day of your going out from Egypt all the days of your life. Ben Zoma explained the days of your life might only mean the days. All the days of your life include the nights also. The other sages, however, explain it this way. The days of your life refers to this world only, but all the days of your life includes also the time of Messiah. Believers in the Messiah can rejoice that we can keep the Passover in the days of Yeshua, our Messiah. Blessed is God who gave the Torah to his people Israel. The Torah speaks about four sons, one who is wise, one who is contrary, one who is simple, and one who does not even know how to ask a question. The four sons represent four responses people may have to God and his word. So could I ask you to come here and read just that page, page 10, please. Okay. Oh, yeah. All the way back. <laughs> <laughs> She's not kidding. She likes giving me a hard time. The wise son asks, What is the meaning of the rules, laws, and customs which the Lord our God has commanded us? You shall explain to him all the laws of Passover to the very last detail about the Afikam. The contrary son asks, What is the meaning of this service to you? Saying you, he excludes himself, and therefore, <coughs> tell him plainly, because of what the Lord did for me when I came forth from Egypt, I do this. It is necessary for each person to look upon himself as if he personally came forth from Egypt. Likewise, it is necessary for each person to have his own relationship with God. It is not enough to have a relative or a friend who believes in Jesus, but each person <laughs> must um, receive him as his Messiah and atonement. As Yohanan ben Zacharias said, Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can, can raise up children for Abraham. Produce fruits in keeping with re repentance. The simple son asked, What is this? To him you shall say, With a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. As for the son who does not even know how to ask a question, you must begin for him, as it is written in the scripture. You shall tell your children on that day. This is done because of that which the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. Thank you very much. For All right. Good job. Um, now this is extra. I won't charge you anything extra for this. <laughs> Mana. What's the bread that they found when they were in, on, on the Exodus and they went outside? Man. What's it called? Man. Okay, you know what you know what that means in, in, in Hebrew? You, you should know now. It means, Man. what is this? <laughs> you know, there, it wasn't any special name, you know, like we sing. You know, I, I know Keith Green has a wonderful song out where he talks about, you know, the, they got tired of having the man of bread and, and souffle, the man of souffle. And, but, but they got tired of it, and then they got the quails. But the point is, they came outside just like the rest of us, and they saw this stuff that God had put there on the grass, and, it, and they said, well, what is this? What is this? And it was the manna from heaven, the blood from heaven. Okay, if you will turn with me, uh, please, to page 11. And this is the cup of judgment. Now, this is the second cup. Now, I, I don't want you to get too confused. If you go to other seders, they might have five cups. There's basically four cups, okay? And that's the way it should be. And the first one we have, we just called it the cup of the sanctification. This is the cup of judgment. And we don't partake of this, but we do remember it because we are not happy Really, we're not supposed to be happy with the plagues that were visited upon Egypt. Okay, we're supposed to be sympathetic. This isn't a matter of anybody sitting there saying, nah, 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 we got you now. This was not the way God wants us to think about people. He wants us to have compassion for the lost. You can read that in the, in the, in the New Covenant, can't you? That we're to have compassion for the lost, that we're to love our enemies as well and pray for our enemies as well as those who are our friends. Okay? So we look at these plagues, we look at them, we say, oh God, it's a shame they had to do this. It is a shame, but I'm glad that we are free from the land of Egypt. Now what really is taking place here, God's trying to get the Egyptians' attention. He's not just interested in the Israelis, or the Hebrews, the children of the Hebrews. He's interested in them too, because these judgments are all judgments against their gods. They're, it's just a way of saying, hey, you got all these gods that you believe in, you think they're really wonderful? Well, guess what? I can do anything I want to because I'm in charge. I'm the God of the heavens. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we look here, and the blood, just, uh, just a couple of them, the blood, we, the river Nile is a goddess. 
but our God would change the river Nile to blood anytime he wanted to. Now, the Egyptians, if you read in your Bible, they come and they do a little thing of changing water into blood as well, but they ain't doing it to the whole river. And they're not making it water again at a moment's notice. At a moment's notice, God changed it back because Pharaoh pleaded for it to, to happen. And there's other, there's other uh, uh, things there. Darkness, the sun god Ra. And yet if you read in, in your scriptures, it says that it was dark in Egypt, so dark that you could feel it. Now, I usually ask this question in Kentucky, and I get a good answer. I don't know what I'm going to hear. How many of you have been to Mammoth Cave? Yeah. Do you remember when they turned the lights out? Yeah. Do you remember that darkness? I didn't like that. I'm a, I tell everybody I'm a nightlight guy in my bedroom. You know, we, I want to see what's going on when I wake up. It was dark in there. You could feel the darkness. I've been in places where it was so dark you could feel it, and that was one of them. That's why I mentioned that. Everywhere it was dark, but in the dwellings of the Jews in the land of Goshen, they had light. Because God is their light, and God is in charge. And then we have the last thing here is the slaying of the firstborn. Well, you know, fertility is a matter of, of a god. They had a god of fertility, but not just that. Even Pharaoh, who himself was supposed to be a god, if he had a firstborn son, his firstborn son was dead. I guess God didn't kill him. He, he might have been the firstborn son, and there might have been a reason for that. But in, 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 in fact, if he had anybody in his household, firstborn son they, or, or daughter, they were dead. They were dead because God is in charge of life as well. You know, this kind of, if you don't mind, this makes me uh, digress just a minute. This makes me think of a, a missionary. A missionary told me one time they were in Africa, and they walked into this one tribe. This is years and years ago. And they were believing in the one God. Now, they didn't have Bibles, and they didn't have crosses or anything, but they believed in the one God. And they went to tell him the story. He says, what's going on? Why do you, why do you believe in the one God? Well, he said, well, we always have all these gods. And we all had them in our house, and we, we had them, and there were just all these different types of gods. And, and then one day we had this huge storm come by, and it just destroyed everything. So we're sitting there one day, and we're putting all these gods back together, repairing them. And we happen to think, well, why do we get to do this if they're gods? And so that's why they decided there's a god that they can't see. There's a god that's in charge of everything, but it isn't this little idol, and they threw it away. So I just thought that was an interesting story. At any rate, uh, the next thing they do, the, the, the Jewish people will have a song called Dayenu. So if you learn a Hebrew word today, it's called enough. Dayenu. You know, if you've done this for us, and I think, let me see, read, you, you turn the page. This is Hebrew here, and it, it's a song, Ailen, Ailen, you, know, you, know, it, you don't want to go through that um, with me, I don't think. But they go, had he brought us out of from Egypt and not judged them, it would have been enough for us. Had he judged them and not judged their idols, it would have been enough. I mean, we can go on and on and on. Had he brought us out of the land of, to the land of Israel and not built us the holy temple, it would have been enough. We can continue to say that all the time. God just continues to do. He just continues to do for us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. He is our great deliverer. As if you look at the bottom of the page 14, as followers of the Messiah, we can add a further dianu, knowing that if God had only provided atonement for us through the death of the Messiah, it wouldn't have been enough for us. But he did much more. Yeshua said, I have come that you might have life and have it in abundance. He gives us peace within when we know him as our Messiah. I think that's pretty important. Okay, okay, we're getting a little closer to the food. <laughs> no, okay. Am I, am, I, am, am I lost any of you yet? It's dark in here. I can't tell. No. Okay. Rabbi Gamaliel used to say, whoever does not explain the following three symbols at the Seder on Passover has not fulfilled his duty. So we have the Passover offering, the matzah, and the bitter herbs. Now, I have to apologize. Uh, I forgot to put the, we have all kinds of shank bones at my house, and I forgot to put one on here. And if you, if you on this plate here, this Seder plate here, there's a place for the zerua which is the roasted shank bone. And that is symbolic of the Passover offering that Messiah himself was. 
So if we read here, the Passover offering, which our forefathers ate in temple times, what was the reason for it? Because the Holy One, blessed be he, spared the lives of our forefathers in Egypt. As it is written, and when your children ask you, what does this mean? My Mishkanah, that you tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. It is also written, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb, this is our Lord now, to the slaughter. As a sheep is silent before her shears, so he did not open his mouth. Also John saw Yeshua coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And remember what I just read at the beginning, where Paul uh, said, Messiah, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. He became the Passover. Okay, the next thing we have is the matzah. The matzah which we eat, what is the reason for it? It is because there was not enough time for our father's dough to rise when the Holy One, blessed be he, redeemed them. As the scriptures say, they baked cakes of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they did not have time to prepare food because they had been driven out of Egypt. The matzah is unleavened. Okay, if you can look at the matzah, if you get a chance, you can see it right now. It's... We want to review this quickly. It's unleavened. It has no, in other words, leaven is a type of sin in the Bible. Can you think of anyone who is without sin? You can say Jesus if you want. <laughs> okay. Yeshua, he was without sin. Okay. The scriptures say in the book of Hebrews, it says that Messiah, that, that he was, we have a priest who was tempted in all things as we, but without sin. He never sinned. He understands you and knows what you're going through, but he himself is without sin. Okay, now, some people will say, you look at it, and it's striped. Now, some people will say, well, that's just the, the technology when they cook it in the furnace, and it just some of it's a little higher than others, so it's striped. Well, I don't care. I still think about a scripture, don't you? And with his stripes... We are healed with his stripes. We are made whole. Okay, and then you go and look, and it's pierced. See those holes in there, which I guess are supposed to help it from rising. It's not supposed to rise at all. It's flat. But on the other hand, I think of a scripture. It says Isaiah, excuse me, in Zechariah 12.10, it says, And they shall look upon me. God's saying this now. God is saying, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one who is in mourning for their firstborn. Now, we really haven't seen that happen yet. It might have been a partial fulfillment on the day of the crucifixion, but we haven't seen that happen. It's talking about God pouring out his spirit upon the inhabitants of Judah and, and the land, and they shall look upon me. And I like that because me is God, and they shall look upon me, and they shall look, they have pierced, well, for I have pierced without, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Me, he's also referring to himself as the one who was pierced. We know that Yeshua is the son. Philip asked uh, Yeshua, well, have we, you know, are, when are you going to show us the father? And wh what did Yeshua respond? He said, have you been with me so long that you haven't seen the father? Now, you know, I don't blame Philip. I mean, we all would probably have said the same thing. But the point is, Yeshua identified himself as God himself, which is exactly what he is. He says, behold, if you look in your scriptures, another place in the New Testament, he says, behold, before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say I was. He doesn't say I will be. He just says I am. Uh, I, 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 I am. What did God say to Moses? I am that I am. That's our God. That's the living God. So Messiah identifies himself as the God uh, of, of heaven to us. Okay. The last thing is the, uh, the maror that you see on there. And that's the bitter herbs. And you'll all have a little bit of horseradish. And I've tested it already. Be careful. <laughs> I, uh, you know, this, this, the senior group that we did, I mean, the stuff that I took there, because I we had little plates for them like you do here. They didn't have a meal though afterwards. They just were getting really spiritual. 
And uh, I'm just kidding. And, and, but the little old lady walked up and says, boy, that horseradish is really good. And I thought, I could barely breathe. <laughs> I mean, I've had some that I like, but not, not this year so far. You know, and we call it Jewish Dristan. <laughs> but it, it, it's pretty, it gets to you after a while. Okay. So at any rate, there's the moror, the bitter herbs. And that is significant to us of the bitterness of slavery, the bitterness of slavery. Okay, if you will turn with me, please, to page 19. Page 19. Okay, now we're going to, uh, of course, in the meal, the, the priest has to wash his hands again. Baruch atadonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher kedeshanu b'mitzvotah, titzivanu al nefilah yadayim. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who made us holy with his commandments and commanded us concerning the washing of hands. So, you know, once again, uh, I was reading um, Edersheim. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. A lot of the seminaries aren't using it anymore. I think it's a wonderful book. It was written by a Jewish believer, Alfred Edersheim, and he was very knowledgeable in Talmudic practice. And, in, and uh, we're going to talk about him a little more. But um, he, he, he says that at, at this point in time, this is when Yeshua washed their feet in water. And, and he, he became the servant of them, okay? And, of course, uh, what did Peter say? No, 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 you can't wash my feet. You're not a servant, because it was a servant that did that. And what did the Messiah respond to him? He said, hey, you don't have any part with me. And, of course, Peter responded, huh, don't wash just my feet anyway. Just get it all. <laughs> and and, and uh, which was a smart thing. But, but I can understand why Peter said what he did. This is the Messiah he's looking at. And this is the one he'd seen raise Lazarus from the dead. Remember that. This is the one he'd seen raise other children from the dead. This is the one who he'd seen uh, make demons depart at his command. You know, th this is not just a nice guy that he liked. This is a fellow that he, he was very aware of, could really do things that no one else could ever do. Yeshua asked him, who, who do you say that I am? And what did he say? He said, thou art the son of God, the Messiah of Israel. And God had shown that to him. Okay. So we move on from there. After they're all seated, and they begin the feast and the food, and uh, but we're not quite there yet. They have uh, those couple blessings. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Okay. Now, I could do some other things, but I'm going to pass on that. Because I'm, uh, we, I'm going to do a little shortcut, okay? Um, you all have some matzah at your table? Yeah. Why don't you take a couple little pieces? Yeah. Just little pieces, yeah. okay? Little pieces. And, and Hillel, Hillel started this. That was a rabbi that lived actually prior to the birth of the Messiah. There was, you know, we, we, if, you'll read, and if you read any commentaries, you'll see a lot of stuff about Shimei. And, and Hillel. And, and Shimei, they went to Shimei and they said, tell us uh, about the, the, uh, the law of God while you're standing on one foot. Well, you know, Shimei looked at the guy and chased him off through rocks at him. He's got him out of there. Well, the same guy went to Hillel and he said, tell me about the whole law while you're standing on one foot. And Hillel goes like this. He stands on one foot and he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And love your neighbor as yourself. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Hillel was okay. Because all, all Yeshua ever did to us was tell us what God had told us before. Okay, so you want to take a little bit of this. You want to put some of this herosis on it. Now the herosis oh. is symbolic of the, uh, the, the mortar that was used. You know, if you'll read in the, in the Bible, this, the Jews were responsible for the cities of Pithom and Ramses. They built them. For the Egyptians. You know, so you take the herosis, put it on there, and you're going to take a, a very little of this. Of this, uh, Now I took too much. I'm going to regret this. Uh, the, of the bitter herbs. And then you're going to partake of it. You, you've got something to eat. I don't see anybody complaining yet. Is it? No, okay. Uh oh. Oh my. Hold it. 
I, my nose is getting ready to leave my face. No, no. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> I should have known better. Okay. So now, now we're going to have a blessing for the meal. And we're going to eat. But I don't know how that's going to... Oops, excuse me. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to be set up, so Randy, you'll explain it after I have the blessing. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, thank you. You guys can go ahead. Okay. Oh, I'll live. <laughs> so, and we can now have a blessing for the meal, and then we'll have that. Then we now, now leave yourself a little matzah and a little grape juice for after the meal. Okay. So you gotta do that now. What did I say? Leave a little matzah. Thank you very much. You can eat all if you want, but leave yourself a small piece of matzah and a little bit of grape juice for after the meal. Because we're not done yet. We've got maybe another 15 minutes of things that we need to talk about that are big, very important. Okay? Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this evening. I thank you, Lord God, for these people that want to learn more about you. I thank you, Lord God, for the messages that you give us, both in the Haggadah and in the Word of God. We are so grateful for that, and we ask, Lord God, that you continue to Bless our hearts, Heavenly Father. They don't have to listen to me, but they do need to listen to you. And Lord God, let them receive something from you this evening, other than the food. But we ask thy blessing upon the food anyway, and we thank you for all the work that went into preparing it. We ask thy blessing uh, be upon it, Lord God, and a blessing upon this time of fellowship as well. For it's the name of thy son, Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Randy, you want to tell them what they're going to do here? Yeah. Huh? We'll talk about that uh, later. What, to not eat it? Oh, you can eat the egg if you want to. Okay, wait, wait one second. <laughs> Usually I do this afterwards, but you can eat the egg. The egg, we don't know where, where that came from. Okay? There are some scholars that actually believe that it was Messianic believers that inserted this into the meal, into the, the symbol. There's two symbols. It could mean the symbol of hidden life, which is what we believe in. We're all, you know, we believe in eternal life and that we're, we're different one day when we're risen. That could be a symbol of that. But it could also be something that they brought from Babylon with them because in Babylon, the, the egg would, would re represent the fertility and they had a god of fertility. And the Jewish people brought a lot of things from Babylon with them too. You know, you don't live very long in a place where you don't acquire something. So you've all heard the term Mazel Tov. You know what that means? It means good stars, literally. Good stars. And the Babylonians were big on astrology. Okay, So who knows what they picked up there. And, and uh, so you can go ahead and eat that now, and that's the egg. But there's, there's some people that actually believe, that, that it was Messianic believers that inserted this in. But eh, nobody knows, and I'm sure somebody will argue with you if you tell them. So. Hey. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, um, there's a couple things we still need to do. So I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, the Gospel of Luke in the 22nd chapter. Now the Feast of Matzah, which is called the Passover, was approaching. The ruling Kohanim, or priests, and Torah scholars were searching for a way to do away with Yeshua, for they were afraid of the people. <laughs> now, I'm going to skip that part. It talks about Satan and uh, entering into Judah. So, and he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a pair of a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And with that, he will show you a large upper room, fully furnished. Make preparations there. So they left and found just what Yeshua had told them, and they prepared the Passover. I guess they might have been good cooks. I don't know. Okay. When the hour came, Yeshua reclined at the table. You hear that? Climbed at the table. And the emissaries with him. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That always makes me think that, you know, we're talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. That maybe that will be a Passover seder, so you all at least know what's going on when you get there. Okay? <laughs> 
and if you don't, if you don't, he'll blame me. So, but please remember that now, for I tell you, I will never drink. And then he goes, and when he had taken the cup and offered the bracha, he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I tell you that I will never drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. Now, there's something I skipped accidentally because I do a, I do a lot of these sometimes and, and, they, and I sometimes get a little discombobulated. If you remember, we had the cup of judgment. Remember, the first cup is the cup of sanctification where God set them apart and from Egypt and brought them out of the land. Then we have the, the cup of judgment. Now, that was not really, you don't drink that. Actually, what they do is they recite the plagues together and they take a little bit of grape juice on their finger and they put it on the plate for each plague. And you look down and you see all this red stuff and you know, the plate's blood serious. Once again, it's very serious. So there was a cup that I forgot to do that with you so you'll forgive me, okay? So if you wanna go home and, and dip out a bunch of grape juice and as you recite the plagues, you can do that because I guess you can keep these books, can't they? Oh, very good. Okay. Uh, but at any rate, at any rate, uh, we read that he made the blessing, and the blessing was one I read to you before. That it's an old liturgy, uh, which the Lord said, "Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam, which is, "Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the Universe, who brings forth the grape grapefruit, or gives us uh, grape uh, the, the wine." Okay, and um, and when he taken matzah and offered the bracha, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, "This is my body given for you. Do this in memory for me of me." Now. Remember, I've had the three matzahs, and I broke the middle matzah. Now, we didn't have any kids here tonight, so I didn't hide it. So if you'll forgive me on that one, uh, Randy. But, uh, and he took this piece of bread, the afikomen. Remember the piece that was broken in two? Part of it was, was put back in between, and the rest of it was wrapped up and hidden away and brought out at the end of the meal, okay? I, I'm hoping these things are clicking in your head because <clears throat> he took this bread and he offered it to them, this piece of matzah, this haven, the broken son, and he offered it to them. He says, take, eat, every one of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. So if you have some matzah on your table, you can take it now. <coughs> like a little piece, just like you do take it and you eat. This is my body which is broken for you. In the name of Messiah we partake and remember him who is broken for us. And then in the same way after he did that, he said do this in memory of me. Then in the same way he took the cup after the meal saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. It's poured out for you. Now the cup that he took after the meal, just like the afikomen was after the meal, this was after the meal. This is the third cup. And the name of this cup is the cup of redemption. I'm hoping that's clicking. The cup of redemption. He who has redeemed us, by, the scripture is very clear, for you are bought the price. You are redeemed. It's the cup of redemption. So we take this now and we bless it. Blessed art thou, Lord God, King of the universe, who gives us the fruit of the vine in Yeshua's name. And we remember him. This was his blood. So there. I hope communion never really quite means the same thing to you in the future. You know, as a kid growing up in a Jewish home and in a, in a uh, synagogue, I had these every year. We do these every year. And I became a believer in... August, uh, right around August of 1970. And I came back, uh, got out of the Army, came back to school, um, went to, I was in college, and uh, I, I fell in with a bunch of Jewish believers. See, I knew these guys were Jews who believed in Jesus, you know, but I thought they were Hebrew Baptists or something, and, and they, did go, <laughs> they did go to a Baptist church. And I thought, well, you know, I didn't want to be like them, so I, I had nothing to do with them. When I was 14 years old, I heard Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. It was the first thing of about him I heard that ever made sense. 
you know, I'd have I'd have Pentecostals say one thing. You know, I went to school with a lot of different kids, and I had friends, and, and, and the Nazarenes would say one thing, and the Baptists would say another thing, and the Catholics would say another thing. I mean, it was very confusing. I said, I'm just sticking with what I got, one God, okay? And uh, uh, so it was confusing. But when I became a believer, knew Yeshua as my Messiah, I went to a Passover Seder with, at a Messianic congregation, which I was attending and getting teaching from, etc. And we went through the Seder, and we went through this, and I thought, it's the first time in my whole life this ever made sense. It made perfect sense. And I was really excited about that because, you know, I, I, it was exciting for me to see that God's plan was so distinct and so well-developed. You know, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, And now Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be, that's like a zip code, because there are more than one Bethlehem. Thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee is he to come forth unto me, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. But uh, I've also heard that a much better translation of the word everlasting is from the beginning. From the beginning, God had a plan to save you and I. From the beginning, God had a plan. I'm looking around the room. He knows each one of you infinitely. You know, it says uh, the very hairs of your head are numbered. He knows that too. That's how infinite. In, intimately he knows you and and that plan was for you from the very beginning can you comprehend that it's difficult to, to kind of get my hand around my arm around it sometimes because I'm thinking you know I, uh, I, I can't how does he think of all that stuff well he is God you know <laughs> but but still that's some plan from the beginning he had this plan and this it was all unfolding right there in front of these people and, and th then later we have Paul, once again, writing for Messiah, our Passover, who was sacrificed for you. Get out the whole leaven. Well, that's something they do. They knew what that meant, get the old leaven out. But he was talking about in your life. Get that old sin out of your life, which is something God wants to do. And he can do that through you. He, he gives you the Holy Spirit of God. You know, the um, 11 Acts 2.38, you know, they were convicted, these Jewish people were convicted about the crucifixion of the Lord and his death, burial, and, and his death and burial. But they were they were kind of curious about the resurrection part, and they but they still felt bad about the the uh, the crucifixion. And they said, "Men and brethren, what must we do?" And what did they say? They said, "Repent, every one of you, and be baptized, and and uh, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit." The gift of the Holy Spirit makes you new. That, that Holy Spirit can purge all that old sin out of you and make you a new person. You are a new person in Messiah. That's, that's what you're reading in the New Covenant, okay? And, and that's what Paul's addressing. But a lot of these things are from what you're seeing here. All these different things that have evolved. Okay, a couple of things I want to mention to you. You'll look down here at this cup. And they actually have a place setting in a lot of Orthodox homes, and that's the cup of Elijah. Okay, and they all sing a song called Eliyahu Hanavi. Eli, Eliyahu, Elijah, please come to us. Well, why do they want Elijah to come to us? Because it was prophesied that he would announce the Messiah. Now, in all honesty, you know, they went out to John, and what did they say to him? They said, are you that prophet? Are you Elijah? Are you the Messiah? Of course, he was none of those things because, first of all, he was John. He was Yochanan. He was Yochanan ben Zechariah, the son of Zechariah. And we don't believe in reincarnation in Judaism. What does the scripture say about your life? It is appointed unto man once. Come on. Randy, these people, they got to know this stuff. <laughs> it is appoint I know they know it, by the way. I do know they know it. It is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. There is no such, such thing as reincarnation. We should never even entertain the thought, okay? And uh, so John is John, Elijah is Elijah. We might see Elijah again. I don't know. Might, there's some people that, that believe he might be one of the two witnesses in the book of the Revelation because he was never, he didn't die, to, from my knowledge. He was just taken away, remember, in a chariot. <laughs> Gone. I don't want to go that way, I don't think. <laughs> I, mean, I haven't decided yet. You know? If you'll let me drive, maybe I will. <laughs> but they have that table here, and they sing, and they wait. They want Messiah to come. There's even, in the liturgy, which they have been now taken out, in the really older liturgy, it talks about Messiah is coming. At, at the very end of the meal, 
They talk about the Messiah coming. Well, what do we just read about at the end of the meal? He's come. He is going to, and we, we, and we remember him when we were take up the blood and the body of Messiah, okay? And, and uh, so that, that tradition was there already, but they've taken it out of their books. Just like you go to a synagogue, they'll move their way through the book of Isaiah, but they won't read the Isaiah 53. And most of you, I'm assuming, have read Isaiah 53, and it talks about Messiah. It's a very clear description of the passion of the Messiah. So they don't want to read it, they skip over it. They think I have an answer for it, but they don't want to read it, they skip over it. So at any rate, you know, I, I, um, I'm going to close. Uh, I want to tell you that you've got these books. Go home and study, study them. If you need some other stuff, we, uh, this is a, a god that we sell. I'm, I'm with an organization called Messianic Literature Outreach. And um, it, 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 if you take M-L-O, it's uh, the Hebrew word is malo, which means to fill. But uh, we're Messianic Literature Outreach, and we publish books and uh, tracts and lots of other different things uh, directly relating to the, the Jewishness of the Messiah and really a lot of, a lot of uh, testimonies about Jewish people who have come to the Messiah. And if you get a chance, if you're really interested, there's something called One for Israel. And you go online on YouTube, and you can see testimonies of Jewish believers. They can be, uh, some of them are Israelis, sometimes they're even Muslims, which I found very interesting, who come to Messiah, Yeshua. And, and uh, the Israelis, they'll, they'll be talking in Hebrew to you, but they'll have the uh, subtitles there. And there's, a, there's a, some people that are, they believe that there's at least as many as 30 or 40,000 Jewish believers in Israel at this time now, which is, which is a big increase. Uh, when I was in Carmiel with my wife, we, there were two Messianic Jewish congregations there, two. And uh, it's not a huge town, but uh, I guess it was big enough for two Messianic congregations. We only have one in Louisville, so. But at any rate, um, there's an awful lot going on, and one for Israel, that's an interesting ministry as well. But um, uh, ours is messianicliterature.org uh, if you, you need something. I know there were some people that wanted that particular Haggadah. That's the new one that we, we publish. This is the old one, and I still use that for presentations with people today. So. At any rate, that's pretty much it. I'm hoping I at least got you to think about these things and to think differently and to at least understand uh, our Lord. Um, let me see. One more thing, if you don't mind, give me a chance. In, uh, there was a, I was teaching one time a bunch of kids, young people, and one of the girls there was a, um, she uh, went to Wheaton and she was a, a Hebrew and Greek scholar. Uh, major, and she went on to Harvard. She's very, very smart, a lot smarter than I am. And we were reading through, and it was the story of the woman who had the issue of blood. And in the translation, it says that she reached for the hem of his garment. And I looked at uh, my young friend, and I said, what does that say? And she looks at me very puzzled. And it didn't say hem. It said fringes in the Greek. Well, that's because Jewish people wear fringes. Back in Yeshua's day, they wore fringes on their garment. If, you'll see, if you've seen Jewish people now, they have like shawls, or what they call a prayer shawl. And they'll have fringes on that because they don't wear garments like that anymore. God commanded them in the, in the Old Testament to put fringes on the four corners of their garment. And when they walked, they would see the fringes like this. And then it would speak to them of the glory of the covenant that God had made with them them. So uh, Yeshua had those fringes on. Well, why? Well, it's because he was Jewish. <laughs> and uh, he was the Jewish Messiah. And I like to think about that because the translations overlook that sometimes. And it's okay. You know, they still get the word out. They still get out the fact of who Jesus is. But that little bit there kind of helps you understand just how much he really does understand you. Because he was walked on the face of the earth as a Jew himself. And so he understands the fact that you can have ethnicity. He understands the fact that you can have differences. And he knows them. And he knows you. And he understands them. And he, uh, and he um, works his way with that with him. So that's just letting you know how much uh, he is involved with you. And the fact that he himself was a person just like us. Okay? Just like you. And he had his likes and dislikes, and 
His, uh, he had his particular ethnic uh, uh, things that he wanted to do, although they were commanded to wear the fringes. Okay, they were commanded. That wasn't just an idea to do. Okay, it wasn't a good idea. It was just something God told him to do. Okay, listen, I'll finish up. I'll close in a word of prayer. Do you have any other questions at all? Does anybody have any questions? Oh, well, that's unusual. I usually get at least one. Come on, no questions? Way back there? Oh. Okay, well, they don't want any. Ask. You can ask Randy because he knows it all too, probably. <laughs> so you can get Randy, and whatever Randy can't answer, you just go to Terry and he'll tell you. <laughs> Even if he doesn't know, he'll tell you something. <laughs> okay? All right, let me close in a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you for each person here. Lord God, I thank you for the lovely Seder. I thank you, Lord God, for all the work that <coughs> went into this. Thank you, Lord God, for the people and their <coughs> their attention and their willingness to, to listen. And help, Heavenly Father, I, I pray that you speak to each one of them and what message you have for them in this. You know, uh, I know that you, you, you want us to look at the Word of God and when we read it, not just see what happened, but see what message you have for us. You have a message for each one of us whenever we sit down to read your word, and we're so grateful for that. So speak to the people, draw them to you, and help them to know more about you every day. For it's the name of thy son, Yeshua, we pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Hamoshienu, our Messiah and our Lord. Hamoshienu Adonai. Amen. Thank you very much. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Can I, what about a lot of applause for the people who did all this work? This was really cool. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. And as this Holy Week continues, as a reminder, tomorrow, um, we have set up all upstairs um, an opportunity for you to come and worship just you and God. And it will be open from 10 o'clock until 8 o'clock at night. Um, but you come through and you follow the, the, the walk. We have a path laid out. And there's scripture readings and meditations and things to really hit home about your own sin and your need for a Savior. So I invite you to do that tomorrow, anytime. Um, if you run through it, it would take 15 minutes. If you do it all slowly, thinking about things, it would probably take 20 or, or 30 minutes for you to walk through that. And then also Saturday, um, the praise band will be down at the river at Bicentennial Park at 3 o'clock. It will be a time of music and scripture reading and testimonies. So I invite you to go on down for that. Bring your own chair um, for that time period. It will be at Bicentennial Park at the river. And then Sunday morning, we will also meet there at Bicentennial Park, and we'll have Easter egg hunt at 10, and then we'll start having special music at 10, and then our, we'll have a, 10, thank you, 1030, and then um, worship will continue at 1045. So I encourage you, if you're not doing the Easter egg hunt, come before 1030 so you can enjoy special music and the rest of the worship service. So any questions about those? things, a lot of opportunity to connect with God and, and each other. Thank you so much, Judy and Aaron, as you guys have um, brought a very special time for us tonight, so we greatly appreciate that. Yeah. God bless you, and um, have a safe drive home.